Hi, I'm Henry, and I want to ask you, how much of your time do you spend alone? I'm not just talking about when you're by yourself. I also want to know how much time you spend surrounded by others, eyes glued to your phones, your focus somewhere else. I'm talking about when you find yourselves alone together. Maybe there was a lull in the conversation, maybe an awkward silence, or you got a text you just couldn't ignore. Well, we're all a little guilty. After all, this is a world designed to exploit our humanity, our need to be accepted and acknowledged. Today, we never have to endure boredom so long as we carry our little magic mirrors everywhere we go. To be alone together is to find a little niche apart from the world, physically separated by inches, but operating in internal spaces miles away. It's a different kind of loneliness, perversion of our human nature, where our desire for togetherness pushes us further and further apart. Technology has a tendency of shaping us no matter what we try to do to hold it back. In ancient Athens, a common saying of Socrates was that the written word would make humanity lazy and forgetful. Somehow, that approach didn't quite work for him, since I got that anecdote from a book. So I'm not going to tell you to throw out your phones, or even to turn them off. Instead, I want to talk about the world we find ourselves with, and the ways that our relationship with technology is changing even today. But I have to warn you, it gets worse before it gets better. So what exactly is the problem with smartphones, social media, and the internet? After all, they allow us to talk across massive distances, find people who share our interests, and access the sum of human knowledge in our pockets. It's easy enough to say that they distract us from the real world, but so do TVs, movie, and in Socrates' view, books. <laughs> uh, the real problem with our technology today is that it is so very good at exploiting our basic human psychology. How much do you understand about the devices you see every day? Not much, right? Well, you're not alone. We live in a society made up of people who could not design, build, repair, or even operate most of the devices upon which their lives depend. In this vastly complex world, we are unable to offer a satisfactory explanation for the many human-made phenomena we see every day. This is why our technology can control us instead of us controlling it. The magic qualities of the digital world leave us in the passenger seat, clinging to the little social media walls and websites that we do understand. In the book Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, he explains that early humans evolved to work in groups, to measure their status against other individuals, and to crave social recognition and capital. These are the ways our brains find a place for us in society, and roles to play in the many relationships that make up our lives. In the modern world, however, there are multiple overlapping hierarchies of status. Money, fame, education, worldliness, and more. This overabundance of status markers and hierarchies in our lives is difficult to navigate. And this is where our technology is so enticing. Smartphones and social media provide bite-sized, addictive chunks of recognition in the form of points, likes, streaks, followers, views, and more. They give us quantifiable numbers on which to compare ourselves, and a constant stream of buzzing, flashing, colorful reminders that we are recognized by those around us. By the way, you can follow me on social media after this performance. <laughs> In the 1990s, British anthropologist Robin Dunbar discovered a correlation between primate brain size and average social group size. By extrapolating, he found that humans can comfortably maintain about 150 stable relationships, the so-called Dunbar number. In this increasingly digitized and urbanized world, we all have access to a massive social circle, way larger than the 150 we could ever fully understand. And the internet is an overwhelming fire hose. More than 40 hours of video is posted on YouTube every minute. This wreaks havoc on our primate brains, but in another way, the internet also provides the answer in the form of the endless subcultures, groups, and communities for interests ranging from Roman literature to memes about alpacas. <laughs> I know personally, I'm a member of one such group. 
Leaving a culture and joining a subculture is a way for the monkey mind to cope with the modern world. These subcultures can both nurture and isolate. When I was in middle school, I was a confused and nerdy kid. Okay, I'm still a little confused and a lot nerdy. <laughs> But back then, I'd get home at three and play video games until late into the night. I played with strangers from strange lands, most of whom I'd never met in person, of all ages and backgrounds, some of whom didn't even speak my language. We forged on behind our separate screens because we had a shared love of an online world. Octomoose23, I hope you're watching this. <laughs> in, a, in a difficult, shifting middle school social world, that was my lifeline, my island in a, a massive ocean of people. Uh, in a massive ocean of people. But even as that community became like a second family to me, I found myself drifting away from the real world, less able to cope with change and more anxious about human interaction. This world of subcultures has had its largest impact on those who've grown up with it, my generation. The devices that have been placed in our hand from an early age have had a serious, have a huge effect on our lives, and it's making us seriously unhappy. According to researcher Jean Twenge, rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011, the same year that rates of Americans with smartphones crossed 50%. It's not an exaggeration to say that my generation is on the brink of one of the worst mental health crises in decades. And much of this deterioration can be traced to our phones. Teens today are less likely to work, date, take risks, go out or spend time with friends and family. The shift is stunning. Today's 12th graders go out less often than 8th graders do. And the number of teens who say they regularly go out with their friends has decreased by 40% since 2000. This shift has had a major effect on psyche. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, there is a direct correlation between time spent on social media and symptoms of depression. And teens who spend three hours or more per day on electronic devices are 35% more likely to have a risk factor for suicide. The irony is, that this sadness comes most often from the most social people, the ones with throngs of online friends and digital followers who are therefore pushed to spend more and more time on social media. Worst of all, we can't know what the long-term effects of growing up like this will be. Adolescence is a key time for the development of social skills and interpersonal relationships, something we're often seriously lacking when tied to a digital niche. So maybe you think I'm going to tell you the solution is to forego our technology, civilization, and maybe even agriculture all together and return to humanity's roots in hunting and gathering. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say that. I like binging Netflix a little too much to give it up. Also eating. <laughs> the example of Socrates proves that crusading against change is unlikely to change anything. Instead, I think there are reasons to be optimistic and ways that our relationship to technology is changing. In the words of technology writer Gwern, society looked at objectively has a lot of downsides. If someone really finds a place in their subculture, which gives them mental ease and physical health, what right do the rest of us have to interfere and drag them into the main culture? In this way, subcultures better provide a space for kids like me, with a specific niche interests, people who find places of acceptance and love outside of the social norm. Culture is, by definition, vast and unspecialized. Culture can't cater to individual interests, but subcultures can. A world of subcultures may actually help us cope with the complexity we see in our day-to-day -day lives. Just as we're adapting to our technology, it, too, is adapting to us. The devices of today can predict our emotions from our words, diagnose our sleep habits from our movements, and bit by bit, technology is learning how we act online when we feel alone. The devices of the future, instead of crudely exploiting our psychology, are starting to act like little 
digital psychologists asking us how we feel and catering our digital experience to enlighten and enliven us instead of inspiring anxiety and frustration. For example, a Stanford researcher has recently created a program called Wobot, a digital therapist for use in messaging clients that has shown huge advances in improving mood and diagnosing depression. And this is just the beginning. Technology companies continue to advance these approaches because they too know that the status quo is unsustainable. As technology comes to understand us better, I hope that we humans will continue to work on understanding ourselves. I hope that every one of you leaves this room with a better understanding of why it is that social technology so appeals to us as humans. And I want to challenge you. The next time you feel the need to look down at your phone, I want to challenge you to look up instead at the people around you or in the next room or outside on the street. The next time you feel alone, I want you to look for another human being and know that what you're looking for isn't found in your pocket. What you're looking for is inside them. And maybe it's inside you as well. Thank you. Yeah.